Hello, I'm Michael Tan and this is the second video in this learning activity. We've previously covered the format of this blended learning activity, the aim and the learning outcomes. Let's examine the first learning outcome, explain the benefits of absolute cardiovascular disease risk assessment. To understand this learning outcome deeply, we need to deconstruct and look at several basic concepts. The term cardiovascular disease is used collectively in the literature to refer to these three conditions coronary heart disease, cerebrovascular disease and peripheral vascular disease. You should know the common underlying pathological process, atherosclerosis, and this will not be covered again in this learning activity. In phase two, you will need to develop proficiency in recognising the clinical presentations of disease, states or pathology. Quite simply, Patients do not come into a clinic or hospital and say, I've come today with coronary heart disease. Similarly, what is cardiovascular disease will be coded in medical records and in clinical trials in many different ways. For example, unstable angina and ST elevation myocardial infarction are both presentations of symptomatic cardiovascular disease. As a self-directed activity, come up with five common clinical presentations or endpoints for CHD, CVD and PVD. Cardiovascular disease is a big health problem in Australia and worldwide. To get a sense of the scale, one in six Australians live with cardiovascular disease. It causes one in three deaths and disables about 1.5 million people. In terms of total burden of disease, cardiovascular disease is just behind cancer. About a fifth of all disease burden is due to cardiovascular disease. As expected, this leads to some major impacts on the health system. Somewhere in the order of half a million hospital admissions per year and 11% of all health expenditure goes to cardiovascular disease. Importantly, we may be able to do something about it. Over 90% of adults have one or more risk factors for cardiovascular disease and two thirds have three or more. To look a little further at costs, this is the PBS pharmaceutical benefits scheme data for the year ending 2010. The PBS is the federal government funded scheme that subsidises the cost of medicines in the community. When a patient in Australia gets a prescription from a doctor and goes to a community pharmacist, if it is listed on the PBS then the maximum that the patient will pay is $37.70 in 2015 or $6.10 if they are a concession card holder. In 2010, the top three drugs in terms of cost are cardiovascular drugs. Atorvastatin and Rosuvastatin cost the Australian health system over a billion dollars. The next time a Pfizer rep gives you a Lipitor pen or an AstraZeneca rep gives you a Crystal mug, that is why. By volume, six of the top ten drugs are cardiovascular drugs. The cost to the healthcare system is not insubstantial. As a self-directed activity, review the most recent data from the PBS. So we've revisited what is CVD, but what are the CVD risk factors? This list is taken from Quick Reference Guide for Health Professionals Absolute Cardiovascular Disease Risk Assessment and different classifications exist. The major modifiable risk factors are smoking, blood pressure, serum lipids and so forth. In Australian general practice we talk about the SNAP or SNAP lifestyle factors, smoking, nutrition, alcohol and physical activity. These are factors that need to be assessed for risk and also for intervention. The non-modifiable risk factors include age, sex and family history. Socioeconomic status is being increasingly recognised as a risk. People who are members of a relatively deprived community have markedly increased cardiovascular risk, double in some circumstances. And then there are the related conditions. Diabetes as a risk factor that increases cardiovascular risk is probably familiar to you all. However, chronic kidney disease, especially stage 4 or 5, or the presence of proteinuria increases the risk many fold. Very important. With regards to risk factors, you need to be cognizant of two important points. Risk factors associated with cardiovascular disease do not necessarily imply causation but may be markers of underlying disease or process. A good example is serum homocysteine. It is associated with high cardiovascular risk, but lowering it does not affect the risk. 
Secondly, the presence of multiple risk factors often has a synergistic effect, that is, more than additive effect on risk. OK, we've covered CVD and CVD risks, but what about this term, absolute risk? Some quick revision. Absolute risk is a probability of something occurring within a specified time frame. For instance, we all have an absolute risk of developing diabetes by age 60, and this could be expressed numerically. The relative risk is a ratio of the rate of events between two populations. For instance, smokers have a relative higher risk of cardiovascular disease compared to non-smokers. This is a worked scenario using a diagram of 100 people. Let's say that the natural history of condition Y is that 12 out of 100 people will be diagnosed with it by age 60, represented by these people coloured orange. That is, the baseline absolute risk is 12%. Now imagine that drug X reduces the relative risk of developing condition Y by 25%. That is, the relative risk reduction taking the drug as compared to not taking it is 25%. That is, if everyone took drug X, a quarter of the people who were going to develop condition Y now do not, represented by these three people in dark green. In other words, the absolute risk of developing the condition if you took drug X is 9%, and the absolute risk reduction is 3%. So, does drug X reduce the risk of condition Y by 25% or 3%? Both statements are correct depending on whether you mean relative or absolute risk. The number needed to treat, or NNT, is the inverse of the absolute risk reduction. In this scenario, 33 people will need to take drug X to prevent 1 from developing condition Y, or an NNT of 33. It is very important by phase 2 that you are fluent with these concepts. If you aren't confident, please read the article by Barrett and colleagues listed on the activity sheet. Why use absolute risk reduction statistic? Let's look at these four different populations. Imagine that the absolute risk refers to the risk of having a heart attack in the next 12 months. Patient 1 might be someone sitting in coronary care unit. Patient 4 is more typical of someone that I would see in primary care. Typically with a medication, the relative risk reduction is stable throughout risk categories. In this scenario, the drug might be a statin, and the risk is reduced by 25%. However, look at the impact. We only need to treat 8 patients who are like patient 1 to prevent one of them from dying by 12 months. That's major. In a typical CCU, of the patients currently admitted, it means one or two won't die in a year. However, in the community setting, the drug is much less useful. Even if I prescribe this drug for all my patients, the odds are that it won't make a difference to a single one of them over a year. Using absolute risk reduction and NNTs allows us to have a much better sense of the utility of treatments. For those of you interested in knowing more about the communication of risk to patients, I've included an optional reading in the activity sheet by Zipkin and colleagues. Now that we've covered the basics with regards to terminology, let's synthesize it together to explain the benefits. Previously, we've identified many risk factors, so why not just address each as they come? The answer to this has to do in part with human psychology. We are often wrong about the importance of an individual risk factor. A good example is in the management of type 2 diabetes. It is typically conceptualized as a sugar disease, and thus the effort is on glycemic control. However, in many situations, it is often more beneficial to long-term outcomes to target smoking behavior, lipid, and blood pressure control first. More importantly, as we have identified before, cardiovascular disease risk depends more closely on the combination and intensity of risk factors than on the presence of a single risk factor because the cumulative effects of multiple risk factors may be synergistic. As clinicians, we are often not very good at estimating risk intuitively. The next two videos will cover assessment approaches that assist with risk estimation. Thank you for completing the video covering the first learning outcome, which is the longest in this activity. Please consider doing the self-directed activities and optional readings 2.1 to 2.4 in the activity sheet. The next video will cover the next two learning outcomes. Identify the information required to use the cardiovascular disease risk charts and calculator, and to demonstrate its use.
I'll see you then.